Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studio, it's time for the GNFCC 400 Insider. Connect, build, and grow with the Greater North Fulton Chamber of Commerce. All right, good morning. I'm Steve Stroud. I'm Executive Director of Roswell, Inc. I want to welcome you to the June webinar series, The Economic Recovery, North Fulton. Uh, we are very happy to partner with the Greater North Fulton Chamber of Commerce, uh, our partners every day, our Chamber of Commerce in Roswell. Uh, we appreciate all they do. We appreciate the partnership, and we're excited. I'm excited from Roswell uh, point of view and business and what's happening. Uh, as we come out of this pandemic, uh, we all are about doing business. And how do we do that? And one thing that this chamber and Roswell Inc. has done together is pivot uh, the, the magic word of 2020 uh, to be ready and prepared to help you, uh, help you and your business and help this community uh, get back on track. And uh, today we're proud to bring a, a good series um, to you with some really good friends. And I promise no attorney jokes at all. Um, because these are friends and uh, we appreciate them giving it their time. Stacy, uh, again, thank you from the chamber. Uh, we appreciate your partnership and we appreciate what you do for us. Uh, not just Roswell Inc., but what you do for this community. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you to say a few words on behalf of the Greater North Fulton Chamber. Sure. Thanks, Steve. We appreciate partnering with Roswell Inc. as one of our city partners and Appreciate you um, moderating today's program. We um, have many great webinars planned for June, and we want to make sure that our members are engaged with those. These are resources and tools to help you with re-engaging your employees and returning to the workforce. All of the May webinars and the June webinars are going uh, to be recorded, and you can find those on the homepage of www.gnfcc.com. That's the Chamber's website. At the bottom of the homepage is our 400 Insider. That's where all of our podcast recordings are held. So uh, we appreciate being a part of this series, and we're looking forward to hearing from our panel today. I'd Thanks. like to um, give you a few Zoom housekeeping rules. Everyone has been muted upon entry, so please keep your microphone on mute to avoid any background noise. If you have a question for any of our panelists at any time during the uh, presentation, please use the Q&A feature, and we will address the questions um, at the end of the presentation and get to as many questions as time allows. Steve, you want to introduce our sponsors? Absolutely. Uh, Stacy. we want to thank our media sponsor, who is Mr. John Ray with North Fulton Business Radio X. He's uh, playing it and jamming it and making it happen with businesses and having those conversations and those interviews. Um, John, we appreciate all you do for the chamber and for our community to help the businesses. So thank you for all you do. And, and again, he's, he's part of that chamber link. Make sure you, you tune into his podcast. Very important. More uh, also is the Roswell Attorney Project. What, what, I mean, we're at Roswell Inc. with the Roswell Attorney Project on the same day. What a great opportunity. Um, the, the, the mission of that group, matter of fact, I was asked this morning, what is RAP? And I said, well, it's a bunch of attorneys that usually aren't social that get together and do some really good stuff for the community. And by the way, they do one big piece is they, they do business together. They make sure that, that we utilize the resources that we have in North Fulton, especially Roswell. Um, and, you know, I'm always about Roswell. And, and that is that these, these attorneys work together. They refer each other business and they're constantly doing good things for this community. And they know each other on a personal basis and a professional basis. And I, uh, I'm really proud, proud to know most all of those members. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, John Herbert and tell a little bit about RAP. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, years ago, Kurt Hilbert and I were um, opposing counsel in some litigation, and we were able to develop a very healthy working relationship based on the mutual respect that we found for each other. We, we realized that it's the clients that were in dispute, but not us personally. So 
um, we, we went about to do our job, which was really to advocate for our individual client, but also to shepherd the process through the litigation. Um, and in my opinion, we came to one of the best settlements I've ever seen and created a real win-win outcome for our clients. Um, I believe our approach saved them tons of money, but then time and outcome. Um, during that time, Kurt and I had some great conversations about bringing attorneys and Roswell together as an example uh, centered around uh, professionalism and civility. Kurt makes a great point consistently when he says, when we take our oath to become an attorney, acting with civility is not part of the oath. Uh, that's why our logo actually bears our central cause, which is civility in all matters. Members of Roswell Attorney Project, or RAP, have pledged to treat each other with civility and to represent civility when working with opposing counsel, even outside of Roswell. Um, our purpose and mission is to build community, civility, and conversation with the, within the legal industry. And we also work on improving better access to legal services, promote better understanding of what lawyers do, and our role in the community. So that's a little bit about us, and uh, we're excited to be a part of the uh, program today. Thank you for the opportunity. John, thank you and the Roswell Attorney uh, Project. We, again, you're, you're friends and you're amongst family, so we appreciate that. You know, as we brought this uh, together and, and talked about what this looked at, looked like, Stacy and I and our, our both our teams, Roswell Inc. And, and the Chamber, you know, we were, were considering a lot of factors, and that is every day things were changing, and they can continually change, right? So trying to be on top of that is is hard for a business owner uh, to know which is the latest report, what's the latest uh, update, which news source to to believe or not believe. Um, but we've got attorneys that are digging in and specialized. And today I'm really pr proud to have this panel together here. Heather Brown is with the Brown Law Group. You can see Heather here, and she can wave and say hi. John Hello. Herbert, she's the she's the rose between the two thorns. We know that. That's okay. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't a joke. That was love. And of course, John Herbert from the Herbert Legal Group and Kurt Hilbert, uh, a good friend. Kurt is there with us today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to John. John's going to kick off the first session with Heather, and we're going to get going from there. Thank you, Steve. And before we start, I have to point out that Heather is a real lawyer. She is actually um, stepped out of a deposition to be with us here today. Downtown. And, uh, yes. Sorry. Downtown. Downtown. And uh, so the way we'll handle is if there's any questions for Heather, we'll take them right at the end of uh, her presentation. The others can, for any for Kurt and I, can be uh, taken um, later in the presentation. So. Thank you so much for, for being a part of it. Um, one, sorry, mom, I'm having, of course, a PowerPoint malfunction. <laughs> That's what happens, right? Um, one thing um, every good attorney has uh, to do a disclaimer, which I'll do as soon as I get control back here. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for your forbearance, everybody. Um, <laughs> I, uh, it is important that uh, I'm bound to uh, tell you that our presentation is not meant to be legal advice. Your situation is unique. I encourage you to seek legal advice if you need further assistance. All of us here would be happy to help you, but we are not soliciting your business today. And remember that the closest attorney may actually be behind you. Heather, thank you so much for being here today, especially for stepping out of your deposition to talk to us about um, leases. No, uh, happy to be here. I, I thought it would be interesting. Uh, just the uh, first question for you is what are some, a lot of us are familiar with residential leases just from everyday life. What are some differences between commercial and residential leases? Well, the first and foremost difference is they're always a lot longer. I don't know why. I think maybe the lawyers want to get paid by the word. There's my lawyer joke. But uh, on a serious note, commercial leases are for business use. Uh, you know, so they're your your storefronts, your small businesses, your office buildings, wherever you're operating your business outside of your home, you're going to have a commercial lease. 
um, they vary in the legal protections that are offered. In fact, um, they're treated more like a contract than a residential lease. So the terms are, could, could be construed a lot more narrowly. There's not as uh, some of the rights in court are different. So they're specialized in that way. They tend to be longer than a residential lease. Most residential leases are one year uh, on the outside, maybe two. Your commercial leases are going to be three to five years, if not 10 years. And occasionally we see them much longer. Um, but it, the length is going to be important. And that's something to keep in mind if you're ever considering one. And then the thorn is the maintenance and repair obligations that come with a commercial lease. Many of us who have, if you've rented property before, you call the maintenance person and they come and take care of everything for you. In a commercial lease, that may not be the case. In fact, you may be your own maintenance person or hiring someone because the landlord will have given you that responsibility. There's some traps in there for the wary. So if you're on this and you haven't read your lease and what your repair obligations are, read it now. Uh, HVAC is a big one that catches people off guard. Uh, HVAC repair and maintenance is not cheap. Uh, there's also renewal provisions and some other not standard language. So it's really important to read your commercial lease. Um, it's important to read all contracts and all documents. There's some more lawyer. That's free advice for y'all. But definitely read your leases because there's a lot in there that you may not expect. Yeah, thanks, Heather. I just I had an experience yesterday. A friend told me that uh, they've got a commercial HVAC that went down to a tune of thirty-one thousand dollars. That was not planned in the business, and it's bad timing for what's going on these days. Um, so we always hear the word rent in a commercial lease context, Heather. What is what does the word rent include? A lot more than what you think. It's not your thousand fifty. I don't even know what rental rates are now in residential, but rent is your base rent, which is typically a monthly payment on an annualized obligation. And then you have what we call additional rent, which includes taxes, uh, insurance, maintenance for the common area, often other fees, late fees, interest, attorney's fees, things that are triggered on default. Uh, it can include other uh, obligations, such as um, if you're paying back tenant improvement allowances. And there's lots of things that can be called rent. The general way I put it is it's gonna be anything you owe under your lease is going to be called rent. And we call it capital R rent because that means you're paying it. And if a, you are in a legal dispute with your landlord, that number can get really big, really fast. Uh, so it may even include utilities in, in some leases. That's great. Now, as we, as we look at recovery and uh, there may be uh, some opportunities to work with landlords and in, in working out, uh, some terms. What are some some of the key lease terms to consider when approaching the landlord about you know talking about what's going on these days? Right. There's a lot. This is a, definitely a time to be creative if you have a need to communicate with your landlord and to review your lease before you open up that those talks. I mean, on the slide before you are some common areas that come up um, that, and I'll touch on them. Of course. The going dark provision, the tenant operating obligations, this is becoming um, more interesting now as businesses and shopping centers and office buildings are reopening, um, but perhaps your business is not. Uh, are you going to be triggering some type of default provision in your lease if you don't open and you're not open to the public during business hours? Those provisions are incredibly important if they're in your lease. Code tenancy and subtenancy, uh, it's a creative way if your lease permit, your landlord will agree for your lease to permit, where you're sharing your financial obligations for the space uh, with someone as a subtenant or perhaps co-tenant liability. There's lots of flexibility there. Uh, cancellation and early termination clauses. Some leases are going to have early termination rights that a tenant can exercise. Very few of those do, I think, but there are some. There may be other provisions that can be triggered to cancel or maybe a mutual agreement. Perhaps this is a natural time for you and your landlord to part ways. Um, you certainly want to read this carefully if you have one or think about what you want if you want one from your landlord. Renewal options and deadlines. This is pretty important. Um, you know, we hear a lot about things being stayed in the courts and the government being stayed and their phases of reopening. Your lease obligations are not stayed. If you have deadlines in your lease, uh, such as triggering the right to renew or an option, 
those are still ongoing unless you have an express agreement with your landlord that they're not. So it's really important to not just assume those are frozen uh, in the same way that legal deadlines are right now. You could look at restructuring defaults and remedies. Um, there may be, you know, some leeway there in negotiating, um, but you certainly want to know what puts you in default. For example, going dark, not being open when you're supposed to be open could trigger a default on your lease. So it's not that you failed to pay rent, but you're in default because you didn't open. Uh, be aware of security deposits and other collateral. Do you have one that could be applied? Do you maybe want to make a promise to make one later? Insurance requirements. I know Kurt will be addressing insurance later in this presentation, so I will defer to him to discuss insurance, but be aware of your insurance requirements in your lease, it, or perhaps do you need to try to negotiate those? Um, essential services. I mean, is, do you need to be open and your building isn't? Has that caused a problem with your business? Are you able to get the services you need from the shopping center um, or development? So on all of these, read your leases and just with some creativity as you go through the language. Now, the next one is a big term that I can never spell. And, and there's, I think there's a lot of uh, um, people think they understand what force majeure is. And it's, it's probably in every lease that we have. So what's, what is that? And how do you spell it? Well, I don't know how to spell it. I can't help you there. And I think even knowing what it is, is going to be, uh, we're all going to learn something in the next few years, as this is, I think, going to be one of the most litigated areas coming out. Well, there'll be many, but it'll be up there. Um, it's essentially, I like to liken it to the impossibility clause or natural causes. It's the provision in your lease, what happens if someone can't perform or if there's acts of God, you, or, you know, war, or you see a lot in that and a lot of leases. Um, but it's any event that's claimed to excuse performance obligations, um, but it has to be extraordinary, unforeseeable, unavoidable by ordinary care. Um, your leases are typically going to refer to it as force majeure. You may see it as impossibility. I think they're very they're very similar. Um, and they may often be very broad provisions, including but not limited to, and then your list divided by the commas. That can include many things. Most likely doesn't include pandemic, but will in the future. Diseases, public health emergencies, as I said, war, acts of God. There's all kinds of language that go in there. Um, stay at home orders. I think that'll be viewed a little differently in negotiations going forward. It's unlikely those of you sitting there who have previously executed leases are going to see those words um, in your leases. Uh, but the language is precise. It's going to be right now construed by the courts very, very narrowly and precise. It's going to be the courts are going to interpret it to say what it says. They often will have rent excluded. So you could have a force majeure event and still have to pay your rent, and your lease will specifically say so. Uh, they may have notice obligations on the landlord or the tenant. There's a variety of them. Uh, you know, I would say that they're a, one of those provisions that people sort of quickly skim through when reviewing a lease. I don't know that a lot of lawyers historically have spent a lot of time changing them. I think that will change on the transactional side, and we'll certainly see some litigation about what they mean and what they do and how they're going to impact obligations. Well, um, I'd like to get into some lease restructuring alternatives. Can you, I call this like buying time. Can you, can you tell us about some of the options that are available? Sure. Uh, you want to be creative and I'll just say from the outset, if you are talking about any of these with a landlord or plan to, please get them in writing and signed. Um, you know, I don't email agreements um, are not necessarily the way to go here. But a deferral, the first one listed, that's sort of the I'll pay later. I may pay all of it later. I may pay part of what I owe you later. Maybe I'll tack it onto the lease. Maybe we'll divide it over months. There's lots of ways that it, it's sort of the we'll pay later. Abatement is akin to a, a forgiveness. May not have to pay you at all. Perhaps I earn the right to have that money forgiven if I'm current for a period of time. It may just be abated as part of, you know, a, an opportunity for everybody to start over, but an abatement is not going to pay more so than I'll pay you later. Um, reduction in your base rent or additional rent, you know, that's sort of looking for the modified amount, maybe for a specific term. Um, perhaps you're adjusting just your additional rent because of services you're not using. 
Maybe you're adjusting your base rent to lower it for now. Uh, but the term is going to be important on all of these. You know, how much and how long are you asking for? Do you need? It's definitely something to, to think about because that'll help you decide which is the best to approach. Along with this, you know, um, early application of your security deposit might be a way um, that you tie into a deferral or an abatement. And that, I think, is going to lead into our next slide. Absolutely. <laughs> I, jumped up, I jumped on you, John. I told, you you're, I told everybody you're the real lawyer on this panel. Thank you. Um, <laughs> talk about talk about how paying something back. You've, you've hit some of these already. But uh, what are some other ways, some other strategies for paying back that, those obligations? Well, you know, extending your lease term may be a way to do it. Uh, depending on how much is on, left on your lease, you may agree to a longer lease. Um, and you could be making your mon- your payments back over time, adding a little bit each month to your base rent uh, as sort of paying back that obligation. So the installment payments or, you know, the payment plan, um, you may agree to stay longer in exchange for an abatement. I, I won't pay these six months now, but I'll extend my term six months. So the landlord may have future security of of rent roll. Crediting your security deposit may be an option, could be an option now, and you have to replenish or pay pay it again later. Uh, Unused tenant improvements, uh, perhaps you could credit those. Perhaps you have, if work hasn't been done yet, it cannot be done or be put off. Uh, Additional security, there's lots of flexibility there. What else of value might you be able to offer uh, to the landlord? Uh, there are landlords who are going to ask you uh, to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program or similar relief. Um, if they're working with you, they're going to want to see that you are making efforts to avail yourself to available funding. And they may ask you for uh, verification that you applied. They may want status updates. They may want financials from you during this time. Um, those are all ways uh, you know, to give some mutual assurance or just for some fact checking, if you will, you know, the landlord is going to want to see that, you know, you are, you do need the relief you're seeking um, and that there is a, a reason, you know, to work with you. And of course, early termination, if you don't have those rights in your lease, that's something you might want to talk about. Perhaps, uh, you know, this lease obligation isn't going to work long term and you and the landlord can reach an agreement um, to terminate that lease early. Heather, what I hear you saying over and over again is keep those lines of communication open with your landlord. Yes, I think it's really important. Uh, Don't make assumptions, particularly during these crazy times, what they're thinking, what they can do. And I think it's also fair from the landlord's perspective to understand that they have their own COVID or coronavirus related issues. And there's going to be things that they can't do. Or they're going to have considerations of what they do for one tenant in a, in a center or a building is going to impact what they can do to others. So, you know, if you're not getting necessarily what you want, it may not be an unwillingness to work with you, but an inabil- inability to get exactly what you want. So be open minded and creative and communicate and uh, don't be offended if they're asking for you to verify or for you to seek relief. You know, it's a difficult and sort of unchartered time in so many areas. But this is one where it really is and present a lot of landlords. And I think one of, you know, I would say as a general rule, they're doing what they can to work with tenants and with their clients and to keep, you know, their businesses intact. So, you know, I think it's important to sort of keep that in mind going into the conversation that, um, you know, now there's always there's always things that will happen, but be open, communicate. Great. Now. Unfortunately, we've had to talk to some clients about just the the consideration of going out of business altogether. Um, How does that play into rent obligations, lease obligations, and those types of things if you're thinking about going out of business? Well, as we've mentioned earlier, you know, leases are contracts. Um, The first thing that I tell people to look at is who is the tenant? Is it you personally? Is it your corporation or LLC? That may impact um, your responsibility for rent going forward. I mean, the lease doesn't stop simply because someone goes out of business. If the lease term is still in effect and it hasn't been terminated, that obligation is still accruing. Um, And it doesn't have to be in a dispossessory or a possession context for a landlord to recover payment. They can sue on the contract itself for a judgment for unpaid rent. So that's really something to keep in mind. How much is left on the lease is 
this a time you may want to try to negotiate early termination uh, because that rent obligation is going to be there. And, you know, Georgia doesn't really doesn't require a landlord to mitigate or lessen its damages. So the obligation to release may not be present at all. Um, so, you know, if that space is sitting empty and you have a lease that's not been terminated or otherwise disposed of, that rent obligation is accruing and there's no argument that to offset it and there's no responsibility of the landlord to do so. In fact, under a lot of leases, additional charges are accruing for marketing and other things that the landlord incurs because you've left early. Personal guarantees, if you've if your LLC is your tenant, but you've signed a guarantee, that's another way you may be personally responsible uh, for the unpaid rent for all or part of the term of the lease. So that's certainly an important consideration because that is an opportunity for a landlord to get a judgment against you personally. And bankruptcy is a consideration. Business, personal, um, there's ways to restructure leases. There are ways to get rid of leases. There's a lot of solutions to maybe give a business temporary relief. And part of what we've seen under the CARES Act and a lot of, you know, the leg- the confusing stuff on uh, everything COVID related is an expansion of the ability to file a small business reorganization case. So there's going to be, I think, more small businesses maybe availing themselves to some of the bankruptcy protections. If you are thinking of any of these routes, I strongly encourage you to speak to some type of lawyer um, because this gets really uh, technical in particular. Did we lose John? <laughs> no, he's there. <laughs> I'm like, what happened to my screen? Sorry. <laughs> my world so, changed in front of me. <laughs> so what I hear you saying, Heather, is stay in business and keep paying your rent. Yeah, that's what, of course, that's I'm going to say. Excellent. That's, that's what we're hoping for, for everybody that's uh, that's with us here in Roswell, North Fulton. That's right. Um, Definitely stay in business. Um, and I just wanted to comment uh, before, in just wrapping up, you know, the court's may or may not be um, lifting the judicial stay. But I think those in Fulton might be interested to know that Fulton County, at least at the magistrate court level, has already got a very structured plan in place for how they're going to resume landlord tenants. And they're going to be starting potentially as early as June 22nd. Um, some of these cases that have been pending are going to start being back in the courthouse. So the sort of uh, what we thought was the unending delay may be ending and it's time to really address these obligations. If you haven't already been in conversation with your landlord, you want to do so quickly. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Steve and Stacy, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Stacy. we have some questions. I want to reiterate something that was very important. I didn't mean to cut you off, Stacy. Communication is the key. John said it. Heather said it. I know Kurt's going to say it. We've said it all throughout the, the pandemic. Communicating with your landlord and going at it in a non-adversarial role uh, up front to say, hey, this is this is what it is. And then if it gets adversarial, you call one of these folks. Right. But at the end of the day, they want they've got their obligations, too. And working with them and communicating with your banker, your landlord and your attorney is just so key to everything being uh, resolved. And uh, I just. I reiterate that to people every day, and that's just life, right? We do that with our spouses. If you communicate, you're in a lot better shape, I promise you. So yes. anyway, Stacy, questions for Heather? Yes, so we don't have any questions in the um, Q&A um, just yet. So I think that um, you did a great job of explaining everything. And great. another um, point, too, I think to Steve's point is there are a lot of options. And don't think that, you know, you only have one path. Uh, seek some professional advice and communicate and, you know, just um, try to figure out what's the best way for you and your business. So, John, I'll turn it back over to you. Heather, thanks again. I appreciate you stepping out. Thank you. Sorry, I have to go, but thank you all. And I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Heather. Bye, Heather. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. All right. Next, we got John Herbert, uh, our man on the ground at in Roswell, Milton, and North Fulton all together. Uh, John has been in in practice here since 2013, and he is one of our go-to guys. So, John, go for it. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, liability, reopening your business and opening your liability. You know, the, the health professionals will never let us go outside again. 
Um, and if you ask any, if you ask your attorney, is it safe to go outside from a liability standpoint? You know, I'll get very Dr. Fauci on you and say, no, it's never safe to go outside <laughs> um, when it comes to liability. But we all know that we have to live with risk and liability. So let's talk about how, to, uh, you know, what's lurking out there for us. And as, it, it, as far as this presentation goes, we're going to take a look at uh, first employee liabilities that you may have as, a, as, as running a business and also um, customer client liability. Um, there are executive actions and executive orders, um, both at the presidential level and the state level that are relevant to us. There's the three phases of opening up America again, put out by the White House. And then of course the governor puts out regular business safety guidelines and different industries have different guidelines. Um, those are very important, and those those should be followed um, in, as a as mitigation to to your risk. Um, are either dispositive to say that you will have no liability if you follow the guidelines in these executive actions and executive orders. Um, the answer to that is probably no. But if you follow them, you will you will at least have some defense to stand on. Um, it is interesting. Uh, Governor Kemp issued an, a, an executive order specific to healthcare workers and employees, which gives them some protection, um, except for you know the obvious willful misconduct, gross negligence, and bad faith. Um, will that one stand up? Again, we don't know. There is some statutory authority for the governor to be able to do something like this, but. Um, we will see. I would not put all of my eggs in that basket. I would make sure that I'm following guidelines and um, paying attention to the latest guidance, not only from the governor, but from the White House, from the CDC and others. Uh, both Roswell Inc. and GNFCC have great resources for that on their, on their pages and update us continuously on email. So thank you for, to both of you for keeping us up to date on those guidelines. I encourage you to pay close attention to those as, as we continue to recover. Um, generally, immunity can only come from the legislature. Uh, that means it has to be enshrined into law and go through the, the regular legislative process. U.S. Congress is looking at that. If you watch the news, you know there are commitments from people like um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who says, you know, the next deal must have uh, legal safe harbors or there's going to be no deal. We'll see how that goes, and that will be interesting. And again, a, a source of litigation probably in the future, even if we get that relief. I understand as well that Georgia General Assembly is looking at some type of immunity having to do with reopening your business as well, so stay tuned there. Um, as far as liability empl uh, to employees, there are two different kinds. One is not very... Uh, is not used very often at all. Um, if an employee is injured on the job or presumptively gets uh, sick from uh, the coronavirus and has, and has measurable damages, they can choose one of two routes. One is just a good old-fashioned personal injury claim. Um, they do have to go to, to court to do that. Um, so employers in Georgia owe their workers a duty of care, a right to a reasonably safe workspace. Um, they, if, if they, if they take this route, they have to go to court. You have to prove the, the, the duty of care. You have to prove damages and you have to, to prove that the damages were active. So it's, it's actual, it's, it's a very cumbersome process. It's, it's like any other, uh, personal injury claim. Um, on the other hand, the mo the more direct route is, uh, via workers' compensation. Um, that is an administrative system. It doesn't go through court. Um, the key here is the trade-off is, um, for the employee, the employee doesn't have to prove that the employer is at fault, but the trade-off for the employer is that employee is not paid from a court damages, uh, damages issued by a court, but is paid by a worker's compensation insurance. So those are the two different kinds of things. I think worker's comp will be the largest, uh, play the largest role in that type of liability. Um, some new liability for employers, um, this, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act or the FFCRA, that deals with employers with fewer than 500 employees. I was actually 
uh, surprised to see this onerous uh, responsibility put on employees and this was employers. And this was before the PPP came out. Um, so a lot of people on this webinar have fewer than 500 employees. Um, there are certain exceptions for employers with fewer than 50. Um, I broke the PowerPoint rule, put a lot of information on the slide. I'm not going to read it, but I wanted to be here for anybody to take a look at. Um, and again, you know, it's self-certifying these exemptions for fewer than 50. So whether or not those actually apply to you, um, you know, you, you have to be very careful because you may not find out until later until there's until there's lawsuits. But the slides will have those as well as a link to some of the uh, other broader questions. Um, what does the FFCRA call for? Well, it calls generally up to two weeks of paid sick leave at full pay. Um, and the and that's for these five categories. Obviously, this is somebody himself or herself comes down with the virus. Um, they're protected. Uh, or if they're caring, caring for certain individuals, family members, there's a, there's a list there uh, to consult on what family members you can, you can uh, care for and have this protection. Obviously, it's modeled after the Family Medical Leave Act, um, which a lot of us aren't subject to because of, uh, because of the size of our companies. But that was the model for this. Save that position for them, pay them some money, and um, hopefully we come through it at the end. There is one exception to that, um, which is which is really going to be an interesting, and when your lawyer says interesting, it's like when your doctor says interesting, it's never good <laughs> for you. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be, um, I think, uh, looked at very carefully, because if you're, if you have childcare, if you have a need for childcare and your daycare is closed, okay, um, technically, you could be put on leave for up to 12 weeks at two thirds pay. Um, and then there's a lot of questions on, you know, if the child care provider is 25% open, does that count as open? Or did you try to put your child in, in daycare and couldn't, or did you not bother? Uh, these are all questions that are, that are going to come up, but, uh, 12 weeks sick pay at two thirds pay is, uh, is pretty serious, pretty serious business. Um, so it's important to check and see if you're exempt from, from those types of things. And it is very fact dependent on your case. The bright spot is, is these expenses as, as an employer are fully funded, but they're fully funded through a tax credit from the treasury department. That means through your, through your tax return. So you'll take those expenses, you'll get them back. But, but when you file your, your tax return there, I think there's some provisions that are going to allow you to be paid earlier than that. Um, already there coming down, coming down the, uh, through legislation and regulation. Um, so that's, that's a lot of your employee liability. Um, now let's look at customers and clients. Generally, uh, for customers and clients, you're looking at premises liability claims and how those can be extended to um, perhaps a customer or client being at your place of business and contracting the, the, uh, the coronavirus. Um, generally, all business owners in Georgia own their invitees. Invitees would be customers and clients right to safe conditions on the property. You have to keep your property safe if you're having the public into your, into your place of business. Um, if your property contains a dangerous condition and you know about it as a business owner or should know about it as a business owner, um, then, then a potential uh, uh, litigant against you would have to prove that you failed, that you knew about it or should have known about it and you failed to fix it or to warn the patrons of, of its existence and that this dangerous condition results in actual damages. Um, as far as, as far as lawsuits, because of say a contracting a, a, a coronavirus at your place of business, I think there's going to be difficult for plaintiff's attorneys to, sh to, to prove that it actually happened at your business, especially given the, the two week lag time that the virus seems to have. I think it would also be hard for a plaintiff's attorney to um, argue that, you know, uh, people going into that business didn't know about it or didn't assume the risk. So there, there are some defenses there about that business. Um, but again, um, the important thing is when it comes to these premises liability claims, 
follow the guidelines, and I believe that will mitigate some of the um, some of the, the damages, if any, that that come against you. Just be very cognizant about about what is going on. Um, let's look at waivers for a second. Um, a waiver is a written contract between two more parties where one party acknowledges the risk and in order to accept the services from, from somebody else, um, that party is agreeing, Hey, I'm going to come here and take advantage of what you have to offer. And I'm promising that I'm not going to sue you if I get, if I get injured. Uh, what's important is the waiver has to be clear. Um, there has to be clear intention of the person waiving to know what rights are actually being waived. They have to be clear and unambiguous. Um, and this will protect you normally in uh, uh, just uh, normal negligence, just failing to to do what you're supposed to do. But it will not cover you if you act intentionally, if you act recklessly, or um, you're grossly negligent. Um, and and uh, the waiver cannot contradict public policy. So does do coronavirus waivers contradict public policy? Will the will it be will the courts decide that it's more important to let people who've signed waivers actually recover from people um, and uh, then enforce the waiver. That's, that's quite possible as well. We just don't know where that litigation is going. So to waiver or not to waiver your business is an important thing to, to think about. So in summary, um, look, if you depend on executive's order alone, it may be risky, but at least follow all of the guidance coming out of out of the executive and their agencies. Um, relief from Congress and the General Assembly would be welcomed, but will also be tested. It's a good time to check your workers' comp coverage with your insurance provider, um, as, as well as your premises liability coverage um, and how they're treating the uh, the coronavirus. Again, proof is going to be difficult, proving damages, but not impossible. Uh, and you can consider a liability uh, waiver. Uh, just know that its effectiveness uh, will be tested. And I'll end by saying, um, as much as we don't know about the coronavirus from a scientific and medical standpoint, we know infinitely less about the legal, legal repercussions it's going to have in the next years, next years to come. John, thank you so much. Um, I know we'll have questions at the end for you and Kurt, uh, but I want to I want to hear from Kurt. Kurt uh, Hilbert, Hilbert Law Firm, uh, founder of that firm. Uh, this is the one I really uh, he's got all these accolades, but this one gets me. America's top 100 high stake litigators. That would be my friend Kurt Hilbert. Um, he's a go-to get it done guy. When uh, we first had this pandemic, I have to tell the story. I um, I immediately thought of the insurance we bought for business loss that we cover for Roswell Inc. It's something that I've had for years, and it's something that I immediately called Kurt and said, "Kurt, what do we need to do?" He said, "You're going to get denied, but go ahead and apply." Guess what? We did, and we we were one of the first ones in a week. Now. That we, we got our letter back. We know where we stand and Kurt's going to know where we, we're going to stand in a, a couple of years. And we won't get that back immediately. But the importance of it is he was on it. He knew where, where it was going and what it was all about. So Kurt's a uh, mediator, uh, also a professional mediator. He does his best to keep you out of court. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kurt Hilbert. Steve, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone uh, on the panel, as well as all the attendees this morning. Um, I would be remiss before I get into the insurance discussion um, without uh, adding a little to a supplement to Heather's uh, presentation this morning. Uh, she talked about the force majeure clause, but she didn't talk about what happens if the force majeure clause is not in the lease. Um, and if the provision for a force majeure is not in the lease, you still have common law defenses that can be raised from the tenant side, like frustration of commercial purpose, impossibility and impracticability. Uh, you also have something under Georgia law called conditions subsequent, uh, which basically uh, would relieve a tenant from performance if the landlord did not perform on its end. Um, but uh, the communication principle that Steve referred to before, I can't emphasize that enough. If you're a tenant, uh, you need to come with a plan to your landlord. 
Uh, that means financials. That means a, a plan to pay it back um, as, as quickly and as timely as possible. Landlords are not banks at the end of the day. Um, they are in it at the same situation uh, that tenants are. They need to be making money. They have loans. They have mortgages as well. So um, it, it's, it's a partnership and you've got to work it out. So with that said, let's move on to uh, the insurance uh, side of things. Um, um, I, I wanted to do this sort of as a uh, kind of a Q&A, but uh, what I want to talk about um, is, you know, what happens when you're trying to recoup some of the losses uh, from a governmental shutdown? Um, obviously, the governor, uh, Kemp, has uh, instituted a governmental order shutting down the shelter in place. The president of the United States has done it, and even the mayor of Roswell has done it, and other uh, cities uh, in North Fulton have uh, done it as well. So from an insurance standpoint, you know, what can small businesses do to kind of recoup um, some of the uh, uh, the losses? Well, if if you think leases are long to read, um, insurance policies um, are even longer. Um, so when you get your insurance policy in, in the mail, it comes in this big giant envelope and it's uh, it could be over 100 pages long and it's nothing but legalese. Um, but you need to pull that out. You need to read it. Um, and uh, today we're going to talk about uh, basically uh, what makes up an insurance policy, what do you need to look at, and so on and so forth. Uh, but as Steve said, uh, the first thing you do, if you have a commercial general liability or what's called a CGL policy or an umbrella policy, um, or even a particularized policy that would cover um, this particular kind of virus in this COVID environment, you need to file a claim. Uh, the courts right now, uh, there are a lot of class action lawsuits, which I'll get into a little bit later, uh, that are challenging uh, the denials that insurance companies are putting out there. Um, and we'll get into, you know, what physical loss means and direct physical loss and so on. But uh, it's, it's unknown at this time of whether or not um, the federal government uh, or the state governments uh, will pass legislation that will require the insurance industry uh, to cover claims. So if you don't make a claim and you don't file a claim, you're going to be left out. Um, so uh, p- please uh, go ahead and, and make your business interruption claim if you have a business interruption policy. Um, so when we're talking about business interruption, what does that mean? Um, it, it basically means if uh, from a governmental shutdown perspective, you were not able to function as a business. Uh, it's true frustration of a commercial purpose. Um, it also may be loss of use of office space. For instance, your landlord makes a decision that they're going to shut down your building and you can't come and occupy the space. Um, also, a loss of key employees. Uh, perhaps some of your employees have come down with COVID-19 um, or have passed away from COVID-19 um, or are just temporarily ill from COVID-19. Um, there are other insurance policies called key man policies or key personnel and policies that you can look at as well. Uh, to cover for some of those losses. But the most important thing that uh, that people should take away from this discussion today is when you're reading your policy, you have to look for ambiguities. Uh, the insurance companies, first and foremost, do not want to pay out on any kind of an insurance policy. They're in the business of making premiums. They're not in the business of paying out. Um, so you need to look for ambiguities uh, in the definitions uh, sections of your policies versus the coverage section and versus the exclusion section. And then you will have schedules that are addendums that are added on to them as well. Where one provision conflicts with another or a particular provision can be interpreted in more than one way, uh, Georgia law looks at insurance policies uh, as contracts. Um, Heather spoke about leases being contracts. Insurance policies are also contracts. The good news about insurance contracts is they are drafted by the insurer. You as the insurer do not have the ability to alter those contracts. Um, Therefore, if it's going to be interpreted by a court, uh, any particular provision is going to be interpreted by a court of law, it's going to be construed against the drafter, namely against the insurer. Um, And and it will be strictly construed against uh, the drafter of the policy. So if there is any kind of an, an ambiguity, and what ambiguity is defined as under Georgia law is, if there is one or uh, one or more possible interpretations of a term or a phrase or a provision in that policy. So um, there are also other ways, um, you know, regarding uh, dealing with um, uh, the policies, uh, dealing with employers versus employees. Um, and you need to look at how that uh, 
will affect the language in the policy. Um, and then, of course, you can also just look at your legal options to file a direct lawsuit. Um, John spoke about the FFCRA, uh, the FMLA, and the ADA. Those are all federal laws dealing with employer-employee relationships, uh, but they also uh, can fall into uh, the insurance uh, side of things as well, uh, because if you're losing employees, uh, that may trigger uh, things, coverages under your policy. So when you're looking at your insurance um, uh, policy, you'll start off with a declarations page. Um, that's the one page summary of your entire uh, business policy. Um, that typically doesn't give you any language. Uh, it's just what are your coverages, what are your limits, and, and so on, and what are the, uh, the schedules that are attached to your policy. That'll give you an overall um, idea of what your insurance, uh, protect, what you're paying for, for coverages, but it doesn't say what the insurance carrier is actually going to cover in the event a claim is filed. So when you're filing a business insurance claim, um, you, you know obviously you want to call your insurance agent, find out what the scope of your policy is and so on, but do not rely upon your agent to actually make your claim. Um, a lot of times people think, oh, I just can call my insurance agent, um, tell him I've got this problem and, and rely upon him or her to make that claim for you. Um, your policy has very strict language governing how a claim can be made. Um, it needs to be in writing. Uh, and that means by facsimile email or um, you know, just regular mail, uh, you need to make your claim in writing to the insurance carrier. Um, so it's extremely important that when you, um, you make your claim, uh, do not just orally tell your agent, um, please go ahead and make a claim for me, because that will not do it. When you're providing um, and making your claim as well, you need to provide as much information as you possibly can. Uh, in other words, your date of loss, your evidence of damages, attached receipts, photographs, medical reports, letters, the actual governmental orders, shutdown orders. Um, make a specific reference to the policy and the policy numbers the names of the employees that are going to be uh, 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 potentially impacted by this. Um, and when, if it's a key man policy, you, name the, you have to name the specific employee. You have to name the title, their wages, the specific losses, the dates that they were not um, at, the, at the business. So uh, basically any information, information that you can uh, um, provide will be helpful. So what type of policies are there um, out there in order to make and file a business insurance claim? Um, there's, there are basically um, two, two types of policy. There's a claims made policy and an occurrence policy. Um, claims made policies are, are kind of uh, more strict than occurrence policies because uh, if you do not make your claim within the time frame of the policy, uh, the insurance carrier will automatically deny it and you will not be able to make a claim. So uh, an occurrence policy uh, basically goes off the statute of limitations and it will go and will provide coverage for the time of the incident or the time of the occurrence. But uh, so you need to look at the type of policy that you have. And uh, the most critical part about this is do not delay in filing the claim. Um, as Steve said at the beginning of this, you need to be very careful and make the claim as soon as possible. So what happens if my insurance company denies my claim? Um, so this is an extremely important uh, thing to talk about today because the people on, uh, on the uh, webinar have made claims and they've got their declination letters from their insurance carrier. Um, what, do you, what do you do? Um, so the first thing you need to do is document all your communications to and from your insurance carrier. Um, emails, telephone calls, um, anything that you've received, uh, make sure you could just create a file and document everything very heavily. Um, then you need to read your denial and your declination letter and specifically look at what they put in the denial and the dec declination letter as to why they were denying the claim. Uh, many times they will you know, put it, something in there, for instance, regarding COVID-19, there was no proof of a direct physical damage or physical loss. Um, that is the mantra that is being used by many insurance companies to deny claims these days regarding COVID-19. Um, the reason for that is physical loss or physical damage may not and is typically not defined in commercial CGL policies. Um, and But um, the insurance carriers are taking the position that because the, the alleged contamination, uh, namely COVID-19, can be eradicated by cleaning, uh, it therefore does not constitute a direct physical loss. Well, um, the courts are interpreting, you know, those, that position as we speak and we'll see how it all plays out. 
Uh, my particular position on that is uh, you do not necessarily have to have a direct physical uh, alteration of property in order for there to be coverage under a policy. In particular, if you have a schedule or an addendum to your insurance policy that provides for coverage of a threat or an alleged threat of a contaminant, an irritant, um, a virus or a bacteria to physical property. Um, if you have those language and if you have those words in your policy or a schedule, um, then it's very possible that you would have coverage and their denial based upon uh, no direct physical loss uh, could be um, uh, challenged. So um, the interesting thing also in Georgia is the reservation of rights letter. In the initial communication from the insurance carrier, the denial letter, uh, typically you will see some what's called reservation of rights language where they say, these are the reasons why we're denying your claim. However, we reserve the right to assert any future additional um, defenses under the policy that may arise in the future or from any future information that you may submit. Uh, the reservation of rights letter is extremely important um, in, in, under Georgia law because if they don't put that reservation of rights uh, language in the letter, uh, it can be irretrievably waived under Georgia law. Um, so you, you need to make sure that the reservation of rights letter has been done properly and you can contact a lawyer um, to review that to make sure that uh, they properly, the insurance carrier and the adjuster has properly, uh, appropriately done uh, the reservation of rights. Now, last but not least, uh, the bad faith and unfair dealing uh, regarding insurance claims are also uh, obviously worthy of note and extremely important because if an insurance carrier denies a claim that otherwise should be covered, um, there is a statutory remedy to Georgia, uh, to Georgia citizen, citizens under OCGA 33-4-6. Um, that is the statutory bad faith statute. Um, and basically what that is, is if the insurance carrier did not properly invest the uh, investigate the claim or is just outright denying the claim for improper reasons or purposes, um, then you can file a lawsuit against that insurance um, company um, and seek damages as well as uh, an award of attorney's fees um, for doing so. Um, you, it also enables you to file a, a notice with the commissioner of insurance and seek potential relief through them as well. So um, with respect to um, looking at losses in general, um, are there lawsuits being filed currently and what types of lawsuits are being filed? Um, it's across the map. Um, as you can see, there's a gigantic list here um, and it's just growing day by day. Um, and class action lawsuits um, are, are burgeoning as well. Uh, if you want to uh, find out a list of the most recent ones that are being filed, you can go to a website called topclassactions.com. Um, and you can see um, all the various different recent class action lawsuits dealing with these issues. Um, but, uh, you know, workplace employment lawsuits are certainly exploding at this point in time, uh, certainly because of the FFCRA. Um, and I, I would, John spent uh, some time talking about that. Um, I would also encourage folks to look at the Department of Labor regulations and their Q&As on that website, um, because what um, uh, employees have to do in order to claim FFCRA, uh, the burden is not just saying, I want to take my COVID-19 um, uh, time off or sick leave. They actually have to do certain things to claim it and put it in writing to the employer so the employer can justifiably and reasonably determine whether that, that sick leave is warranted. Um, so as you can see in here, um, class action lawsuits, for those who don't know, um, are typically uh, lawsuits that are brought by a few people on behalf of an entire class. Um, and uh, there are general class action lawsuits that are being filed everywhere. For instance, in Alaska right now, there are 8,000 state employees that are claiming that they were subject, uh, subjected to health and safety risks due to COVID-19. Um, so, you know, state public employees have brought a class action lawsuit um, another class action was brought uh, against a company called Innovia Pharmaceuticals by shareholders who claimed that the company made false and misleading uh, claims about potential COVID-19 vaccines. So uh, as you can see, there are just numerous um, areas of law lawsuits that are being um, uh, dealt with here. Um, in, in, in fact, um, educational institutions even uh, are being sued under class actions uh, for classes and, and things that were promised by the educational institutions that were not provided. 
um, and then uh, they were paid for, and then they didn't provide the return, refunds to the students. Uh, the University of Arizona, Drexel University, Baylor, Pepperdine, and University of Miami are currently fi- uh, facing those lawsuits right now. But um, you know, there are voting rights lawsuits. Uh, there are lawsuits against healthcare companies, assisted living, and nursing facilities. Uh, one of the first ones that came out was in New York. The Nursing Association filed a lawsuit asserting that state hospitals were basically petri dishes, petri dishes uh, for COVID nineteen, and that the healthcare facilities failed to take adequate steps to protect pa- patients and, st- and staff. So, getting back to what John was saying about there's a duty of care. Uh, just because you're in the healthcare industry and you're a nursing uh, facility or assisted living facility, you still owe a duty of care. And if you're going to expose those staff to COVID-19 concerns, um, you could be subject to liability. Um, so anyway, as you can see, if you want to move on to the uh, next slide, um, Steve, um, we can move on into the uh, proposed legislation. Is there what is what is being done um, on the state and the federal level with regard to Um, legislation in this area. Um, A number of um, uh, high-profile cases have been filed by business owners um, challenging uh, insurers' denial of coverage on on, on grounds of um, a failure of uh, defining what business interruption is and what it isn't. But what can can legislation do, uh, both state and federally, uh, to uh, provide some clarity to this? Um, Insurance is primarily regulated at the state level, Um, And there are efforts in a number of states to provide coverage of business interruption claims on a retrospective basis. Um, This is of extreme concern to the insurance companies, obviously, because if you're retroactively applying um, legislation, uh, the cost uh, to the insurance carriers uh, will be exponential because many times the insurance policies were not priced to allow for these types of claims or retroactive coverage. Um, so all of the proposed legislation will require insurance to, insurers to cover business interruption losses that were excluded or do not fall within the grant of coverage under their policies. New bills and amendments are being cons- uh, considered right now in Illinois, South Carolina, New Jersey, Massachusetts, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana. Um, unfortunately, nothing is being done in Georgia and perhaps Senator Albers, uh, along with the uh, business immunity bill that he's uh, forwarding. Uh, could possibly deal with this as well and enter a bill on this issue. Um, but uh, the proposed amendment in Illinois, for instance, uh, Senate Bill 2135, would amend the Administrative Code of Illinois to require the Illinois Department of Insurance to appoint a task force on business interruption and insurance. Uh, they would study the impacts of COVID-19, the pandemic, and submit its findings and recommendations to the governor. And then those bills would then force insurers basically to cover COVID-19 related claims for businesses. Uh, most of the state bills would apply only to claims from small businesses. Again, the under 500 employee um, kind of uh, benchmark has been asserted in numerous different laws and the FFCRA. And again, the FMLA is limited only to 50 employees or less. Um, some would allow carriers to seek partial reimbursement from the states. So there is some light at the end of the tunnel for the insurance companies. They can actually seek governmental reimbursement. But as of May 1st, 2020, uh, no state has enacted any legislation, um, uh, you know, to date, but bills are working their way through the committee process. Uh, Alternatively, on the federal level, a draft um, of what's called the Business Interruption Insurance Coverage Act of 2020, um, uh, H.R. 6494, was introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives on April 14th, 2020. It was meant to create a government backstop to share the cost of satisfying business interruption claims. Um, If the increased premium is not paid, an applicable exclusion may be reinstated. Um, However, this act would apply to all property and casualty insurance policies as a whole blanketly across the nation. Um, The act is not explicitly retroactive uh, and does not include any provision for reimbursing insurers for paying future business interruption claims. Um, But as of May 1st, 2020, as I said, uh, it's still pending uh, and has not been passed yet. Um, The... uh, the House committee um, uh, bill would also uh, require insurance, uh, rather insurance insurers uh, to make available business interruption coverage due to viral pandemics, forced closure of businesses or mandatory evacuation by government order and public safety power shutoffs. And any exclusion in force in the date of enactment would void to the extent that excludes the losses specified that I just said. However, such exclusions may be reinstated if a, uh, reinstatement is agreed to in writing by the insured, or B, 
the insured fails to pay any increased premium for providing such coverage after notice as specified in the legislation. Another bill has been introduced on April 14th, 2020, called the Never Again Small Business Protection Act of 2020. That's H.R. 6497. It has a similar um, uh, intent to the, the prior bill uh, dealing with insurers and business interruption policies uh, to provide and make available optional additional coverage that you can purchase to cover those specific business interruption losses. Um, there's also uh, uh, some uh, talk about a uh, establishing a pandemic risk insurance act. Uh, this would be akin to the federal terrorism insurance um, um, act um, that uh, was in, employed after 9-11. Um, the federal government would serve basically as a backstop to maintain stability and share the burden with the insurance industry. Obviously, this, this is the bailout uh, concept. And this is why filing a claim is so important on your business interruption uh, policy right now, because if this law uh, gets passed, um, all of that coverage uh, potentially will be required by that potential act if it gets enacted. Um, so with that, uh, if, if there are any questions, Steve, I'm open. Kurt, thank you, man. Talk about all encompassing. Thanks so much. Stacy. you got some questions? I know yes, we do. Um, long, but I think that the information was so important for small business. Yes, definitely. We have a couple of questions. Um, I think the first one um, is probably going to uh, go to Kurt. Um, we have a member business who is reviewing their policies and um, sending all their questions to their insurance agent about coverage and all the other questions that go along with that. Uh, should they rely on their agent for correct advice or should they seek advice from an attorney? Uh, that's an excellent question to whoever anyone posed it. Uh, my answer to that is uh, absolutely go seek a lawyer's advice and interpretation. These insurance policies are written by lawyers for lawyers. They are extremely complex. And the way they are put together, it's it's like reading Greek. Um, so unless you have prior experience or are an insurance agent yourself, there's no way a layman is going to understand what the policy means or says or what's excluded, what's covered. So I would not rely upon just going to an insurance agent for this. Uh, I would definitely go talk to a lawyer. I always say that it's worth one hour of a lawyer's time to save you a heck of a lot of money on the back end. Amen. Great. Thank you. Um, and John, is there a best place to find out information about any updates on um, land lease, uh, leases, landowners, any kind of issues with that? Is there a, a great place to go um, for our members to find that? Unfortunately, that's not really the, that, that type of information, as far as I know, uh, isn't being centrally um, organized. Some of the thing that Heather alluded to was, you know, the, the, the courts aren't really open and operating now for new cases. We don't know if that's going to be extended. So if, if you're in a potential uh, eviction uh, situation, it's important to get with your landlord because, I mean, it's it's coming. And I know Fulton County itself has got a very organized approach to handling a very, very large volume of, of backlogged cases. The We're basically governed by the Supreme Court of Georgia and under their order. Um, so the one, the one place to look at is when, you know, quote unquote, courts will open up again. Um, is uh, you can go to the, the website of the, of the Georgia Supreme Court. Sure. Uh, well, thank you very much. Steve, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, I know we went a little long, but you know what? <laughs> that was important because we, we need this information. Um, again, I, I encourage everybody to communicate. Make sure you sign up for these, these uh, economic recovery webinars. There's going to be more. There's two more. There's one next Thursday. Uh, Stacy's got it up on your screen. Uh, we've got a Coffee Connect that's free to all uh, North Fulton businesses. To come, come join us tomorrow morning. Uh, be a part of that. I want to thank John Ray, as always. Good to see you, my friend. Too, buddy. I want to thank the Roswell Attorney Project. Yay. Uh, Kurt, John, and Heather, thanks for being with us this morning and helping us better navigate and understand the murky waters that we're all in. Uh, but you know what? We're starting to see it clear out. It's a beautiful day. Go do business in North Fulton and make it a great day. Have a great one. See ya.